Welcome. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. Our, pr our program here is entitled A Look Ahead, and we call it that because we want you to look forward to the time when you will be discussing this lesson with your class in your Sabbath school. This is a series on the sanctuary for the last three months of the, of the year of 2013, and this lesson is the one just before Christmas. We hope that you're prepared and that you're having a wonderful Christmas season. It's the lesson number 12 in our series for December 21 of 2013. Before we begin studying this very significant lesson entitled The Cosmic Conflict Over God's Character, we'd like to ask you to pray with us as we bow our heads. Our kind and loving Father, we can't imagine a more important topic than what's going on in heaven and what it implies about you and your character and your government and the way you run things. Help us to speak about it in the right words, to make it as understandable as we possibly can, so that people may rejoice in it as we do, as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. The cosmic conflict, which is sometimes recalled the Great Controversy, is over God's character and His government. It's a theme that pervades Scripture. Fortunately for us as Seventh-day Adventists, Ellen White has taken up this theme and expanded it, expanded on it by pointing out places in Scripture that focus on it. As a result, she wrote her five most important books, The Conflict of the Ages series. And, of course, the last one of those books is entitled what? The Great Controversy. The Great Controversy. Now, Let's, let's be fair and honest. Almost every religion and even many secular books talk about a conflict between good and evil. I mean, every, even you know, horror movies and other things like that, there's, there's always a conflict. There's the good side and there's the bad side, right? Many religions have multiple gods, some of whom are good and some of whom are evil. The followers pray to the good gods to get their blessing and try to appease the evil gods to avoid their judgments or punishment. But the Jews first then Christians and then Muslims became great monotheistic religions. What does that mean? One God. One God. We believe there is only one God. And what is that God like? Unfortunately, many ideas and teachings, even of these monotheistic religions, have implied that God is angry and must be appeased. In other words, what kind of a God is He? Is He a good God or an evil God? An angry God, at least. God. Sounds Just like he's image. certainly not very friendly. He's almost like one of those evil gods, isn't he? Well, how do we explain this? What's going on here? Seventh-day Adventists believe that Lucifer, and what does the name Lucifer mean? Light bearer. Bearer of light. Where does it come from? Covering cherub of God. Lucifer is the Latin word for light bearer. In Greek, the word is phosphorus. Okay, interestingly enough. And it was one of the names of God that was given to Satan. He was the first and highest of the heavenly angels. In addition to the heavenly angels, we believe that there are beings living in the other worlds throughout the universe. And we'll look at that a bit later, but that's a, a, a implied by Job 1, and 1, verse 6, 2, verse 1, and Job 38, verse 7. But God also is a God of love, 1 John 4, 8. 16, and I, I'm sure everybody's familiar with that. And he recognizes that in order to have love, he must also allow freedom. And in the context of freedom, it is always possible that someone will choose not to love, but to rebel. And who did that? Satan. Satan. And where do we read about that? Revelation 12. Revelation 12. There are three main passages that talk about Satan's coming from heaven, falling to this earth in the Bible. Uh, if we take them in the order of the Bible, we'd go first to Isaiah 14, 12 to 15, then we would come to Ezekiel 28, 12 to 19, and finally to Revelation 12, 1 to 12. But Revelation 12, 1 to 12 actually talks about going back a little bit earlier, perhaps. And I'm gonna, I'm, we don't, we're not gonna take time to read the whole passage we're going to drop down to verse 7 of Revelation 12, which says, Then war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, who fought back with his angels. But the dragon was defeated. And by the way, 
So now, who is who is the dragon here? Satan. Satan. Well, listen to the words, words here. But the dragon was defeated, and he and his, his angels were not allowed to stay in heaven any longer. The huge dragon was thrown out. That ancient serpent called the devil or Satan that deceived the whole world. He was thrown down to earth and all his angels with him. Does the scriptures teach that there's a real devil? Yes. You just read it. <laughs> That's one of the questions that we're going to struggle with in this lesson. What kind of war was this in heaven? Well, that's a question we could spend a lot of time philosophizing on, but we really don't have a lot of information. It can't be a war of, of guns and, and atomic weapons and so forth like that. It has to be a war of ideas. I mean, how, how, what else could it be? You know, something, something like that. Um, no physical struggle, no wrestling between one angel and another? And he, when he, it says the deceiver of the whole world, Really, he had a lot of experience deceiving in heaven because he convinced a third, it yes. says, uh, to, to yes. cast him out to this earth or uh, swept him out to this earth. So, apparently, and of course, when you, my understanding of deception is you sugarcoat the lie to make it palatable, and uh, that's deadly. Mm -hmm. And if it is, the, the uh, rest of the angels, the other two thirds of the angels, understood or heard, excuse me, heard the message. And they still have things to learn. And it wasn't until the cross that it got it settled that God was always telling the truth. Well, I heard the word war meant um, politics or gossiping. And so Satan was gossiping mm -hmm. about God. And some of the angels believed his gossip, yeah. which is a lesson for us. We're not supposed to gossip. Well, let's come, yes. Lucifer was God's representative to the angels. Who was supposed and yet to be. He, he somehow deceived those people. That twisted he was, the words. He twisted it to where he misrepresented God. Mm -hmm. And he, yeah. did he do that for self gain? He wanted well, let the me angels. read you these, these words from the Bible itself and see, see what you think. Okay. This is Ezekiel 28. I'm starting with verse 12. Mortal man, he said, this is God, Lord spoke to me again. This is God speaking to Ezekiel. Mortal man, he said, grieve for the faith that is waiting for the king of Tyre. Now, is this talking about a human? Well, listen. Tell him what I, the sovereign Lord, am saying. You were once an example of perfection. How wise and handsome you were. You lived in Eden, the garden of God. This cannot possibly be a literal king of Tyre. This is, here's an evil person who's attacking the children of Israel, and God is using him as a symbol of Lucifer, right? Um, you lived in Eden, the garden of God, and wore gems of every kind, rubies and diamonds, topaz, beryl, carnelian, jasper, sapphires, emeralds, garnets. You had ornaments of gold. They were made for you on the day you were created. I put a terrifying angel there to guard you. You lived on my holy mountain and walked among sparkling gems. Where was Satan supposed to be living? Where, did, where was Lucifer supposed to be living? In heaven. Right there, in the, as if you will, in the sanctuary of heaven, in the presence of God, right? Your conduct was perfect from the day you were created until you began to do evil, and so forth. Okay? And then if we go back to Isaiah 14, it says these words, King of Babylonia. Here's another earthly king. Bright morning star. Bright morning star is the English translation of Lucifer. You have fallen from heaven. Now the king of Babylon didn't fall from, fall from heaven. In the past you conquered nations, but now you've been thrown to the ground. You were determined to climb up to heaven and to place your throne above the highest stars. Who are the highest stars? <coughs> Excuse me. The heavenly hosts. Okay. Where do, we, where do we see other references to stars? The above the highest stars are angels. So you, you wanted to place yourself above the highest angel. He wanted to be the high, highest angel. Mm -hmm. Look at, look at uh, we mentioned the Job 38, 7. Look at that for just a second. This is God talking about creation and his processes in creation. In the dawn of that day, the stars sang together. Now, do you think this is talking about literal stars? Oh, it's... It goes on, and the heavenly beings shouted for joy. So sing together goes with shouted for joy, right? This is Hebrew parallelism. 
So the stars have to be parallel with heavenly beings, right? Mm -hmm. Heavenly beings are stars in that sense. So we can summarize. Lucifer was, in fact, a light bearer for God, actually bearing one of the names of God given to him by God. He was an anointed, covering cherub, standing beside the throne of God in heaven. He is described as walking amidst the stones of fire, that would be around God's throne, and covered with gems. But he became proud because of his beauty. He wanted to be equal with God or even superior to God, and thus he was cast from the stones of fire, that is the presence of God, down to this earth, and he managed to take a third of the angels with him. He was in Eden, the garden of God. And how did he get there? He was allowed to be in one place. Ultimately, he will be sent down to the deepest part of the world of the dead. Ezekiel 28, uh, uh, 17, it says, you corrupted your wisdom. Mm -hmm. That sounds like a, like a type of insanity. Mm -hmm. he went yeah, yeah. Well, notice that Isaiah said, he said in his heart, verse 13, implying that Lucifer began quietly thinking to himself, and then later he was trading, which probably refers to the slandering of the character of God and stirring up rebellion. Excuse me. Mm -hmm. I just heard a lecture where I, gossiping, trading was mm -hmm. related to gossiping. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Okay. He wanted to have the power of God and the ability of God, but he tried to do, it, do that without having the character of love that necessary to be God or to having the fat nature of God. Thus sin began in God's family. Well, when God created our world and placed Adam and Eve in the garden, because he allows and requires freedom of choice, he allowed Satan one place to approach them. What was that place called? Tree of knowledge, Tree of, knowledge. Tree of, knowledge of good and evil. That was supposed to be a protection for Adam and Eve because they were supposed to stay away from that tree. And if they had stayed away from that tree, where would we all be right now? In the Garden of Eden. In the Garden of Eden, presumably. But as we know, Eve was deceived, took Adam with her, and they became the first pair of sinners on this earth. Satan then immediately claimed that he was the prince or king of this, this earth. Many years later, we get a hint about Satan's activities in the story of Job. And now let's look at those verses for a moment. Job 1, starting with verse 6. When the day came for the heavenly beings... And the other word for heavenly beings we already learned is what? Stars. Stars. When they have, for the heavenly beings to appear before the Lord, Satan was there among them. The Lord asked him, What have you been doing? Satan answered, I've been walking here and there, roaming around the earth. Did you notice my servant Job? The Lord asked. There is no one on earth who is faithful and good as he is. He worships me and is careful not to do anything evil. In other words, Job was a perfect man, right? Righteous and upright and blameless. Yeah. Satan replied, Would Job worship you if he got nothing out of it? You have always protected him and his family and everything he owns. You bless everything he does and you've given him enough cattle to fill the whole country. But now suppose you take away everything he has. He will curse you to your face. All right, the Lord said to Satan, Everything he has is in your power, but you must not hurt Job himself. So Satan left. And we know what happened, right? So, a few verses later, in Job 2, 1 to 9, what happens? Is that when Job's friends come? Well, no. Job ends up with just with nothing that of what he cherished. Yeah. Well, when the day came for the heavenly beings to appear before the Lord again, Satan was there among them. The Lord asked him, where have you been? Satan answered, I've been walking here and there roaming around the earth. And, you know, I, I, I enjoy reading this. I don't know, but <laughs> I enjoy reading this. Here's the entire universe gathered around. They're all watching. And God says to Satan, And uh, did you notice my servant Job? And now it's what's almost, Satan going to say? Huh? It's almost like um, he was rubbing it into God, walking around the earth, looking at all the evil and stuff that... Mm -hmm that goes against him, and then he turns around and says, have you seen my servant Job? It's yeah. almost like he's rubbing him back. Exactly. Well, Satan's yeah. walking around like as if he owns the place. Yeah. 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 Well, you persuaded me to let you attack him for no reason at all, but Job is still as faithful as ever. 
Satan replied, a person will give up everything in order to stay, to stay alive. But now, suppose you hurt his body. He will curse you to your face. Now, Satan must have known he was skating on thin ice at that point. Because he hadn't made one tiny bit of progress yet. So the Lord said to Satan, all right, he's in your power, but you are not to kill him. Does that remind you of anything coming in the future? Oh, the, yes, the angels. The 144,000. Satan is going to do everything he possibly can to eliminate God's people from the face of the earth at the end so that he can claim this earth is his. And what's going to happen? He's going to fail. Well, who has always been the accuser of, the, of God's faithful people? The adversary. Satan. Let me just read Revelation 12, verse 10 really quick. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now God's salvation has come. Now God has shown his power as king. Now his Messiah has shown his authority for the one who stood before our God and accused our brothers and sisters day and night has been thrown out of heaven. And who is that? It clearly identifies it as the devil or Satan right there. And doesn't, uh, sorry to interrupt you, doesn't right. the name Satan imply accuser? Yes, opponent of God, the accuser opponent of God, yeah. Satan claimed that no human being could be worthy of such a statement of, of being perfect and upright, as, as God had said about Job. And, we, and, and in effect, Satan was calling God a liar. Look, look at Job 4. We often don't read these verses about, from Job. Here's, here's Job's message. In fact, this was actually came to one of Job's so-called friends. Can anyone be righteous in the sight of God or be pure before his Creator? God does not trust his heavenly servants. He finds fault even with his angels. And who, which angels is he talking about there? <coughs> Lucifer and a third. Yeah. Do you think he will trust a creature of clay, a thing of dust that can be crushed like a moth? Someone may be alive in the morning, but die unnoticed before evening comes. All that he has is taken away. He dies still lacking wisdom. So in other words, we know, Satan and all his friends here, we know that nobody can be perfect and upright like Job supposedly is. God says he is. Now, where is that passage from? Job 4, 17 to 19. Okay. Okay. So, then, there Job, pardon me, Satan was calling God a liar mm -hmm. in the context of Job. And yep. he was also calling God a liar back in the Garden of Eden yes. to Eve, wasn't he? He's, he? He likes to do that. So, who can be trusted? Yes. Well, look what the end, of the, the end of the story comes in Job 42, the last chapter. After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz, I am, and this is one of Job's so-called friends that is actually mouthing the words of, of, of Satan. I am angry with you and your two friends because you did not speak the truth about me as my servant Job did. And if you know the Hebrew way of thinking and talking, if you want to really emphasize something, you say it again. So look at the next verse. Now take seven bulls and seven rams to Job and offer them as a sacrifice for yourselves. Job will pray for you and I will answer his prayer and not disgrace you as you deserve. You did not speak the truth about me as he did. Wow. So the same thing can be said about the 144,000. They will speak of God as God... Um, really is and, and God will appreciate it. So our highest service to God would be to uh, understand who he is and let others know who he is. Yep. But you know God let them know how serious it was that he didn't tell the truth about God. But yet there was an opening there for forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you've got this anger but then you still have forgiveness afterwards. But more important than that, well, not more important than that, that's a very important thing. What, is, what does this tell us about God's character and the way he runs his government? The book of Job. It says, God can predict in advance exactly how we are going to respond. He knew before that story started that Job was going to be faithful. And he was Right. And that concept is practically totally lacking from most commentaries yeah. on the book of Job. Yeah. Are you saying God understands his children? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, what are you saying? Did he look through time or did he look at 
Job's character at the beginning, and he knew that that well, character would <coughs> last. The honest truth is, I don't know how God does it, but he did it. <coughs> okay. okay. But there's, there is two ways to look at it. Yeah. So I, I think and, it was a character In either way, himself. in either case, God was right. Mm -hmm. He judged Job correctly. No matter what Job had to go through, he came out the other end and God said, there's my friend Job. And who was defeated? Who was shown to be wrong in that argument? Satan. Satan. He was absolutely wrong. And it's kind of funny in the book of Job, toward the last few chapters, it's like hardly anything mentioned about Satan. Yeah. He's just gone. He's, he's not attending the councils in heaven and making broad boasts anymore, at least not right at that point. Huh? But the philosophy, the teaching on the part of these four friends was a similar, quite similar to what we have today. What were they peddling? Look at yourself. You're miserable. You're economically you're destroyed. You must have offended the, the, the deity. And uh, that's what the churches are peddling today. Instant Pros wealth and instant health. Prosperity theology. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. So it's what, a little different. What? It's more positive. It says if you're good, then... Yeah, sure. You know, you're... Yeah, but, but look at yourself. In fact, look at Jesus. Well, he was despised and rejected of men. Isaiah 50, well, 53. Mm -hmm. So uh, the old philosophy is if you're well off financially and your health is good, God's smiling on you. And the conversely, <laughs> the opposite. Yeah. So what exactly was God, was Satan accusing God of in Job? He was accusing a God of not being able to judge character correctly. Okay. Satan. And not being fair, too. Yeah, not being he fair. Because you, you, you yeah. know, just, just give the Job reason, enough rope, he'll, he'll hang himself. Yeah, you, you, you know, the only reason Job looks good out there is because, God, you're just pouring your blessings on him. Put yeah. Take away those blessings and see what happens. Let me at him. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's interesting to notice in Daniel 7, 9, and 10 that there, and we should read those verses. This is a really key passage. While I was looking, um, we, we don't have time to go back and read the whole context. Uh, well, I think there's enough here. While I was looking, thrones were put in place. One who had been living forever sat down on one of the thrones. Who was that? God. One who had been living forever? God. His clothes were white as snow, and his hair was like pure wool. His throne mounted on a fiery wheels, there we are with the fire again, was blazing with fire, and a stream of fire was pouring out from it. There were many thousands of people there to serve him, and millions of people stood before him. The court began its session, and the books were opened. What's getting ready to happen here? Judgment. It's a judgment scene. And is God quietly doing his judgment in the corner somewhere behind locked doors? No. He's doing the it very entire open. universe is free to watch as much as they want. God's government is very transparent. It's a key idea. So if we are in the pre-advent judgment at this time, <clears throat> then the entire universe is what we would say. Our, by our theology, the entire universe is, is uh, observing this process. Right. They've been watching a lot longer and than that. This is just kind of a replay of the finality. Where do we, where do, it just says that specifically in 1 Corinthians 4, 9, uh, right. 4, 4, uh, 19. 4, 9. 4, I mean 9, 4, 9, yeah. Uh, but there's still the problem of sin. How does God deal with sin? Well, Romans 8, 3, look at the last part of that verse. I don't want to take time to read those. It's a long verse. Jesus came with a nature like sinful human nature to do away with sin. How does he accomplish that? That's from the Good News Bible. The, the Greek says just to deal with sin or concerning sin. And then the, in the Hebrews it says the next time he comes back, he's come back to heal as opposed yeah. to... Well, the, the, the issue of sin is who's telling us the truth. That's really the issue in, in the great controversy. Look at Romans 3. Now let's, let's back to Romans 3. And here's a, these, there's several really key passages here. Let's look at it very quickly. Starting with verse 1. Have the Jews then, remember in, in Romans 1, Paul pictures the heathen, the pagans. And look, I mean, they're a, they're a sorry mess. He turns to chapter 2 and he says, And you Jews who have had so much light, and light of all the light you've had, you are worse than the pagans. So now he comes to chapter 3. Have the Jews then any advantage over the Gentiles? Or is there any value in being circumcised? Or in other words, being a, a, a circumcised Jew? 
Much indeed in every way. In the first place, God trusted his message to the Jews. But what if some of them were not faithful? Does this mean that God will not be faithful? What if God's so-called supposed to be representatives are misrepresenting him? Then what? That's what Lucifer did in heaven. Yeah. Certainly not, is Paul's answer. God must be true even though every human being is a liar. God must be true even though every human being is a liar. As the scripture says, you must be shown to be right when you speak. You must win your case when you are being tried. Who's, not, who's being tried? God. God's being tried. And then he talks about, down to the next what, 10 or 15 verses, he talks about the fact that we are all sinners, and he concludes with that verse in that Romans 3.23, everyone has sinned and is far away from God's saving presence. And then his conclusion, we're, we're saved by the free gift of God's grace, all are put right with him through Christ Jesus, who sets them free. And then this key, these, this key passage, verses 25 and 26, and again I'm reading from the Good News Bible that rearranges the verses, uh, the, the words a little bit. God offered him, that would be Christ, so that by his blood or his sacrificial death, he should become the means, that's a long word that we, I wish we had time to talk about, by which people's sins are forgiven through their faith in him. God did this in order to demonstrate that he is righteous. One time. That's the first time he's mentioned that. In the past, he was patient and overlooked people's sins, but in the present time, he deals with their sins in order to demonstrate his righteousness. Whose righteousness? God's righteousness. His righteousness. In this way, God shows that he himself is righteous and that he puts right everyone who believes in Jesus. Before God talks about helping us, he has to say three times that he has to justify, he has to he has to prove his own right, to demonstrate, not just say, to demonstrate his own righteousness. What does that tell us about the great controversy, about the cosmic conflict? What does it, what do you see when you see righteousness? Righteousness, righteousness be, really means right being, right doing, right character. Okay, but how do you judge that? God will always do the right thing yeah. in all circumstances. Well, anybody can say that. Well, that's, well, yeah, that's, that's why he that has that to would, I was explaining what the demons, uh, the okay, answer so was. so that's my question. What are we seeing when he demonstrates it? Okay, well, let's just run through that very quickly. Back in Genesis 2, 17, what does it say? If you sin, you will die. Romans 6, 23 says, the wages, well, sin pays its wage, death, right there. Satan's first opportunity to speak to Eve, what does he, what does he do right up front? Genesis 3, 1 to 5, he calls God a liar. He says God is selfishly withholding something from you that would really be a, for your benefit. You could know good and evil. How wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the way he couched it, but you get toward the end of the chapter 3, and God says, now man is like one yeah. of us. They, they do know good and evil. Yeah. So everybody will know good and evil before eternity begins. Does this help us to understand the priorities in the great controversy? Well, let me read these, this passage. This is, this, is from great, I mean, this is from Desire of Ages, page 37, paragraph 2. With intense interest, the unfallen worlds had watched to see Jehovah arise and sweep away the inhabitants of the earth. What they saw down here was a sorry, sinful mess. And they thought, a oh, God of justice is going to do what? Wipe them out. I mean, why, why waste your time with those people? Just get rid of them, right? And if God should do this, Satan was ready to carry out his plan for securing to himself the allegiance of heavenly beings. He had declared that the principles of God's government make forgiveness impossible. Had the world been destroyed, he would have claimed that his accusations were proved true. He was ready to cast blame upon God and to spread his rebellion to the worlds above. But instead of destroying the world, God sent his son to save it. Now, had the flood already happened once? Oh, yeah. And so... Um, I think the flood probably made, gave them an opportunity to do just that. Mm -hmm. uh, not as, you know, not to the full end, mm -hmm. but um, yeah. it, it was God wiping out everything. Yeah. But there was a specific reason back at that point. God was losing touch with the world. 
he, he, he has to have at least a few people down here that he can talk to. But wasn't that Satan's purpose all the time, was to have him lose touch with yeah, the oh world yeah. so that he would go and wipe them out? Well, yeah, that's, that's what they Satan were given wanted. an opportunity to climb on the boat, and only eight <laughs> took their but invitation. But still, he wiped them out. We wonder about those eight. Oh. Yeah. Right. Well, they corrupt. <laughs> they did. They did listen. That's yeah. all. <laughs> Out on the boat. Yeah. Well, though corruption <laughs> and defiance might be seen in every part of the alien province, a way for its recovery was provided at the very crisis when Satan seemed about to triumph. I mean, I'm sure this. This, if you read the Bible, this happened a number of times in the days of Esther. He thought, "Great, I got this decree. We're going to wipe out all of God's people," and then he lost it. I mean, in, in the times of Jesus, he, Jesus is born, and so there's Herod, kill him. I mean, how many times has Satan thought he's just, the dark ages, he must have thought, I just about got this. All the people who claim to be Christians, what are they doing? They're killing the real Christians. We just, we get within a hair's breadth of reaching our goal, and then God pulls, sort of flips something, and bang, he's got to sort of start all over again. Like trying to catch a pigeon at the zoo. <laughs> <laughs> One step right ahead. Right. At the very crisis when Satan seemed about to triumph, the Son of God came with the embassage of divine grace. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus virtually died as a direct result of sin. He had to be revived by an angel coming down from heaven. And remember, the, look at that verse, Luke twenty-two forty-three. An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. <coughs> The word is more like revived him, okay? Notice that he was so distraught by the separation that had come between himself and his father that he was sweating great drops of blood which were falling to the ground in the next verse, Luke 22, 42, 44. The onlooking universe realized exactly what was happening there, and they agreed that God had told the truth about sin. What was the truth about sin? sin it leads least. to death. It leads to death. If you are separated from the source of the life, what happens to you? You die. But we as human beings had no idea what was happening in that garden. In fact, if, Je if, if they had done nothing, if God had done nothing and just let Jesus die in the garden, what would our conclusion have been the next morning when we woke up and went into the garden? Heart attack. He must have a heart, heart attack or a stroke or something. Man, he was young. How, did he, how come he had this heart attack? Now, do you think that physical s stuff that was happening to him was really what was convincing them? Or was uh, it they, he, that the fact that he was going through all this okay. was doing it? I, I'm a physician, mm -hmm. and I know about physiology, about what makes the body but tick, I at least a little bit. Okay. I don't, so but I'm, I didn't I'm, see it. Okay, so I'm going to talk about this a little bit. When the blood vessels start breaking up, and so you're sweating drops of blood, the entire physiology is breaking down. Now, I, I look back at that and I would say, okay, what, what's happening there? What's happening is this. God is the one, in fact, Ellen White says at one point, she says, every heartbeat is a rebound from the touch of the finger of God. Now, that's a, that's a metaphor. We all know that's a metaphor. But what she's really saying is that every physiologic process, the beating of your heart, the breath, the breathing, the brain, everything happens because God is making it happen. He, he's the one who designed the rules that make it work, and we may spend billions of dollars trying to figure out how it works. God made it that way. He, he, he figured it all out back in the beginning. And, and when we separate ourselves from Him, when we allow sin to come between us and God, what we are in effect are saying is, God, back off, leave me alone, and if God backs off far enough, what happens to all our processes? Shuts down. They come unglued. They just come apart. They fall apart. But you know, he didn't have to do this. Well. He didn't have to do it. I mean, Jesus didn't. He did, Jesus didn't have to do it. So he went through all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that's what's more impressive than all this corpuscles blowing up or something, all that. Well, the, the, the reason that's important isn't about the corpuscles busting up. The reason that's important is to say sin leads to death. And he was not a sinner. And, and that's collateral it's damage. And that sacrifice can be done clear to the end of life. 
Well, sacrifice, on the other side. Sacrifice always leads to death. And that's, that's, what, that's what sacrifice well, is all no, about. No, not always to death. I mean, Well, if, if you're talking about the sanctuary sometimes. system, it leads but, to death. But, you know, I don't it, know if I want to look at Sacrifice is a giving up of something. Yeah, for, for the better good. Right. Mm -hmm. For Do you think that was Christ's humanity? Uh, it, you, when you think about oh, yeah. it, you, but what I'm getting at is you would think in the position he was in, he would have realized that somewhere he would have separated from God. But it seems from what little we have that it surprised him. Almost. Maybe. Well, Romans 4.25 is he was given up just like God's going to give up the sinners. Right. He is handed over, uh, let, let go. When Jesus said on the cross, it is finished, John 19.30, and died, his disciples were doing what? Were they out there saying, yeah, we got it. We figured yeah. it out. They were hiding behind locked doors in terrible fear and disappointment while the universe was doing what? They were rejoicing. Not that Jesus was dead. They were rejoicing because they saw God you told us the truth. But a further question had to be dealt with. How does God treat sinners? Are his judgments fair and righteous and true? And the Bible says that many, many times, all the way through. Psalm 90, verse 10 and 13. 2 Timothy 4, 8. Revelation 16, 5 and 7. Revelation 19, 2. Lots of times. And that's just a, a, just a smattering, just the beginning. God's character is revealed in his judgments. Abraham was right way back in Genesis 1825 when he said, the judge of all the earth must deal righteously or justly. As we approach the end of the world, this world's history, there are three phases of judgment that vindicate God's righteousness. Okay, now we're, to, we're coming down now to talking about judgment and righteousness, okay? In the pre-advent judgment, which is going on right now, from 1844 to whenever Christ comes again, the rest of the universe agrees that God has judged righteously and fairly. The righteous will be taken to heaven during the millennial period, and they will confirm that statement. After how many years? I don't know. They were given a, we will be given a thousand years. Whether I don't think it will take us that long to look over the records and say, yeah, God did everything that he possibly could to save as many people as possible. There's nothing more that God could have done. So now the, all the righteous have agreed with God. And finally, at the third coming, following the crowning of Jesus Christ high above the New Jerusalem and the panoramic scene depicted in Great Controversy, page 666 and six, up to 668, even Satan himself will bow and admit that God's judgments have been righteous. And that's back in the Bible in Philippians 2. Look at this passage. The attitude you should have is the one that Christ Jesus had. He always had the nature of God, but he did not think that by force he should try to remain equal with God. He didn't exercise his divine power while he was here on this earth. Instead of this, of his own free will, he gave up all he had, and I think maybe that's what you're trying to say, and took the nature of a servant. He became like a human being, and that's what, Carrie, you were trying to say, and appeared in human likeness. He was humble and walked the path of obedience all the way to death, his death on the cross. And Phillips translate that, the death of a common criminal. For this reason, God raised him to the highest place above. That's where he's going to be when he's crowned above this light, you know, up above the New Jerusalem, and gave him the name that is greater than any other name, and so in honor of the name of Jesus, all beings in heaven, on earth, and in the world below, the world of the dead, that's Satan's kingdom, will fall on their knees. And all, including Satan himself, will openly proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I mean, man, we all should say amen, amen. shouldn't we? Amen. amen. Even Satan will bow and admit that not only God's superior power, not admit not only God's superior power, but also God's justice, righteousness and fairness and recognizing the supremacy of Christ. And you can read that in more detail, Great Controversy 670 and 671, just a few pages further on. So, where do we fit in all of this? What's our role? We're the actors on the stage. Okay, let's look at some places where it sort of implies that. Matthew 516, right there, square in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, in the same way your light 
must shine before people so that they will see the good things you do and praise who? Your Father in heaven. You and your church. No, your Father in heaven. How many Christians do you know whose actions cause people to praise God? I don't think I need to say any more about that. Is it really possible for Christ followers on this earth to bring glory to God's name or by contrast even to shame it? Is there any evidence even from the Old Testament that God's friends recognize the importance of doing things for the benefit of God's name and character? And there's a bunch of places. Um, look at Ezekiel 20 verses 8 and 9 just as a, as a starter. I'm going to pick a couple of spots. But they defied me. This is God talking about the people who have gone into exile now in Old Testament times. They defied me and refused to listen. They did not throw away their disgusting idols. They give up the Egyptian gods. I was ready to let them feel the full force of my anger there in Egypt. But I did not, since that would have brought dishonor to what? To my name. For in the pre presence of the people among whom they were living, I had announced to Israel that I was going to lead them out of Egypt. So he led them out of Egypt for the benefit of what? His name. We could look his reputation. His reputation. Verses 13 and 14. Verses 20 and 20, 21 and 22 there in Ezekiel 20. Again in 43 and 44. Again in chapter 36, verses 20 through, 30, 20 through 32. And I like this one from, from Daniel 9. I'm going to start. I don't have time to read the whole thing from verse 4, but... Look, look at starting from verse 16. Look at Daniel's prayer. This is fantastic. Actually, let's start from 15. O Lord our God, you showed your power by bringing your people out of Egypt, and your power is still remembered. We have sinned. We have done wrong. You have defended us in the past, so do not be angry with Jerusalem any longer. It is your city, your sacred hill. In other words, your reputation is at stake, right? All the people in the neighboring countries look down on Jerusalem and on your people because of our sins and the evil our ancestors did. Oh God, hear my prayer and pleading. Restore your temple, which, is, which has been destroyed. Restore it so that everyone will know that you are God. Listen to us, oh God. Look at us and see the trouble we are in and the suffering of the city that bears your name. We are praying to you because you are merciful, not because we have done right. Lord, hear us. Lord, forgive us. Lord, listen to us and act in order that everyone will know that you are God. Do not delay. This city and these people are yours. Whose reputation is Daniel praying for? God's reputation. No question about it. Could we have a group of people at the end of this earth's history that would really focus on doing things for the benefit of God's reputation? When, when it says that God... <clears throat> does things to protect his own reputation. I didn't leave him open to criticism, to being a little uh, narcissistic and, uh, well, that's, that's being you know, very kind of... On, on, the, those, on the part of those that are doing the criticizing. Yeah. But God has to be shown the truth about him so that he can win a, his creation over to his side and, and, main, and hang on to the ones by evidence, demonstrating, teaching. Yeah, I think it's just a show of consistency. Oh God. Okay, yeah. But if it's a law of human nature, you become like the person or thing that you worship or admire. Mm -hmm. If you have a God that is arbitrary, vengeful, unforgiving, exacting, severe, and tyrannical, <laughs> who wouldn't say anything to do with him? Mm -hmm. So he has to show what he's really like. There's a handout we prepared some time ago that you might want to look at, entitled The Great Controversy in Scripture. And it's found under the teacher's guides and general topics in our, on our website, Theox.org. Go there, look under Teacher's Guides, go to General Topics, and you'll find two handouts that really spell out these issues. One's entitled The Great Controversy in Scripture, where all these verses are listed, and the other one is called The Plan of Salvation in the Setting of the Great Controversy. You might want to look at both of those. So what are we supposed to learn from all of this? We need to recognize that we are the theater to the entire universe. We are living on a stage. And there's our 1 Corinthians 4, 9. Maybe we should read it just once again. For it seems to me, this is Paul speaking, that God has given the very last place to us apostles, like people condemned to die in public as a spectacle, and the Greek word is theater, for the whole world of 
angels and of uh, humanity. But the first, f first mention is what? Angels. God intends for His church to teach the universe something about His goodness and His righteousness. Ephesians 1, 7 to 10, Ephesians 3, 7 to 10, and Colossians 1, 19 and 20. It's, if you read those passages a few times, I, I especially like my, my Good News translations. It's just absolutely phenomenal in those verses. Of any group, Seventh-day Adventists have the most logical and consistent understanding of Scripture. By contrast, note these words from our Bible study guide. There are many Christians who deny the very existence of Satan, seeing him as merely an ancient superstition held by primitive people who are looking to explain evil and suffering in the world. Think about how great a deception such a view is. It's hard to imagine what kind of a Christianity could deny the reality of a power that is so often revealed in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, as a real being. I mean, there he is fighting against God. What does this tell us about how just, how powerfully influent, about just how powerfully influenced some churches are by the inroads of modernism and secularism? What can we as Seventh-day Adventists learn from the mistakes that we see others making in order that we may not fall into the same deceptions as well? Without a literal Satan, what happens to the whole great controversy theme? That's in the section for Friday in our lesson. And demonstrating the truth about God's character and government is so important that even if every single human being were lost, God would still have to do it. Now that is absolute heresy to many Christians. They think that the whole plan of salvation is about how God's going to save you and me. Well, for Seventh-day Adventists who take Ellen White seriously, we need to look at this passage. It's found in Signs of the Times, July 20, 1899, paragraph 2. Signs of the Times, July 12, I'm sorry, did I say 20? July 12, 1899, paragraph 2. And I, I want, if you, you know, this is a very significant passage, but it's, it's not quoted anywhere else. It was in order that the heavenly universe might see the conditions of the covenant, that would be, that would be the, the relationship, the promises of redemption, that Christ bore the penalty on behalf of the human race. So he came down here to do something for human beings in order, so who's going to see, who's going to learn about it? The heavenly universe, right? The throne of justice, that's God's throne, right? Must be eternally and forever made secure, even though the race be wiped out. And what race is she talking about? Human. That's the human race. Even if we are completely wiped out and another creation populate the earth, they still would have to, get, have to get that message. By the sacrifice Christ was about to make, this is talking just before he was ready to be sacrificed or ready to be killed, all doubts would be forever settled and the human race, there's the race she was talking about, would be saved if they would return to their allegiance. Christ alone could restore honor to God's government. The cross of Calvary would be looked upon by the unfallen worlds, by the heavenly universe, by satanic agencies, by the fallen race, and every mouth would be what? Stopped. Stopped. That process was a plan of preservation on the part of God to preserve the other two-thirds that yeah. stayed around in heaven. Yeah. The plan of salvation or plan of healing for us but it was a process of preservation for them. Yeah. So who's able to describe the last scenes of Christ's life on earth, his trial in the judgment hall and his crucifixion? Did any human beings really understand what was going on there at that time? No. Not really. Who witnessed these scenes? The heavenly universe, God the Father, Satan and his angels. That whole thing was for the benefit of the onlooking universe. First of all, they were the pre people who came to the premiere showing, if you will. <laughs> okay? It wasn't until a long time later that we sort of started figuring out, oh, guess what? We were supposed to learn something from that. So what has the universe learned from the great controversy so far? They witnessed firsthand the pride and selfishness of Lucifer leading to a war of ideas in heaven. God had to deal with that in some way. He had to be righteous and gracious at the same time. But not only does God expect the universe to learn lessons from all of that, 
He expects us to learn also. Ultimately, we are left with several very significant questions. One, can God be righteous and fair and still save sinners? Yes. Job 1, what do we see? Romans 3, 25 and 26, we already read it. Moses and Paul said, absolutely yes. So why do we do what we do? But while there are those who act out of fear or hope of reward, we've talked about fear in our last lesson. What's the problem with fear? It doesn't last very long. People might, you know, if I threaten you, you might, you know, you might say, okay, okay, whatever you say, but what happens as soon as I turn my back? Fear is gone, right? Uh -huh. It doesn't have any effect. There was, I mean, think about Mount Sinai. God came down on Mount Sinai. There was that black cloud. There was that thunder. There was that fire. And, that, and God's voice, I mean, I can't imagine what God's voice must have sounded like. And they were there with their faces down in the dirt. Right? Scared to death. And how long did it last? About six weeks. Right? Not even six weeks. Not even six weeks. Then they built a god of gold mm -hmm. and danced around naked and... So many people, very primitive peoples down through the ages, have worshipped God out of hope for reward or fear of punishment, one or the other. So it's a very primitive approach to God. And there are others who act out of a sense of justice and wanting to be a part of the peer group. Well, this is what we believe. This is, this is right. God's going to save all of us. And, I'm, and that, of course, that means me first. Well, I mean, you know, he's going to save all of us, especially me, right? So many of us sort of have that approach. But there are actually some people who do right because it is right. And they do so from principle. Think about that for a moment. Could we reach the place where we would say, this is the right thing to do even if I can't see any reward? I mean, when Jesus died, Ellen White says he couldn't see through the portal, portals of the tomb. He died because it was the right thing to do even if he didn't know for sure if he was ever going to be raised again. Think about that. And here's the way Ellen White puts this. This is Christ Object Lessons, page, pages 97 and 98. The man who attempts to keep the commandments of God from a sense of obligation merely because he's required to do so, you've got to keep those commandments, will never enter into the joy of obedience. He does not obey. When the requirements of God are counted a burden, because they cut across human inclination, we may know that the life is not a Christian life. But can, Boy. We, can we ask God to help us not make his laws not a burden? Because it's he, our natural tendency to say these are a burden. Exactly. God is just waiting for us to ask him to do that. Yeah. Okay. True obedience is the outworking of a principle within. It springs from the love of righteousness, the love of the law of God, the essence of all righteousness. The essence of what? All righteousness is loyalty to our Redeemer. This will lead us to do right because it is right, because right doing is pleasing to God. To do right because it is right. We see, I mean, do we, think about it for a moment. Do we think it's right to kill people? No. We don't want to kill people. We, we, we realize that's not a good thing to do. I mean, go through the Ten Commandments. Every one of them, if you think about it for a while and you understand the principles, you say, yeah, that's the right thing to do. So does it really matter why we obey, or is it only important that we do obey? I mean, God is just waiting to deal with people who don't obey. And notice these incredible words from uh, Signs of the Times, again here, uh, July 22, 1897, paragraph 11. Incredible words. A sullen submission to the will of the Father means I'm doing it, God, so help me, I'm doing it even if I don't want to, will, de will develop the character of a rebel. And what's another word for a rebel? Sinner. A sinner. By such a one, service is looked upon as drudgery. It is not rendered cheerfully and in the love of God. It is a mere mechanical performance. If he dared, such a one would disobey. That's what Satan did. His rebellion is smothered 
ready to break out at any time in bitter murmurings and complaints. Such service brings no peace or quietude to the soul. Wow. It's a, a portion of that quotation is found in That I May Know Him, page 120. So do our motives really matter? Yes. Absolutely. Finally, perhaps the ultimate question is, who is telling us the truth? Whom should we trust and obey? Remember the, 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 the argument back in Genesis 2, 16 and 17 and Genesis 3, 1 to 4. Remember Job 13, verse 15. Let me just quote a couple of places here. I've lost all hope, so what if God kills me? I'm going to state my case to him and may even be it that my boldness will save me since no wicked person would dare to face God. Now listen to my words of explanation. I'm ready to state my case because I know I'm in the right and so forth. Okay? and So God can be trusted. God can be trusted. And let's read it once again, Romans 3, verse 4. God must be true even though every human being is a liar. As the scripture says, you must be shown to be right when you speak. You must win your case when you're being tried. And according to the New Covenant in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34, those who have a right relationship with God will find through study of the scripture and prayer, that God will put his laws, his law within our hearts. He will be our God and we will be his people. And none of them will have to teach his fellow citizen to know the Lord because all will know me from the least to the greatest. I will forgive their sins and I will no longer remember their wrongs. I, the Lord, have spoken. What does he mean by saying I will no longer remember their wrongs? I won't hold it against them. Well, not, I won't, not only, and, and you're right, absolutely, but it's not just I won't hold it against them. We're not even going to think about it. I don't even care that my children used to be sinners. I am so excited about rejoicing that they're home with me now that we're not even going to think about that stuff anymore. The only true obedience comes from learning to know God well enough to realize that everything he asks us to do is for our best good so that we come to trust him. Isn't that what, what the great controversy is all about? And I would say, absolutely yes. That's what the great controversy is all about. Satan's accusations against God have all been proven false and unfounded, and God is the greatest friend we could possibly have, and I hope you absolutely believe that. See you next week.